Good afternoon and welcome everyone to the IMF's Debate on the Global Economy. I'm Sarah Eisen. I'm the host of Closing Bell on CNBC and I am thrilled to be here in person at the IMF in Washington with a distinguished group of leaders to talk about all of the issues facing the global economy. Joining me is Christine Lagarde. She is the ECB president, managing director of the IMF, Kristalina Gorgieva the chair of the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell, and from Indonesia, the Minister of Finance, Sri Mulyani Indrawadi. And then joining us remotely, we've got the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, who couldn't be here today, and she is in sunny Barbados. We're all jealous, and we're happy to have everyone here, the most powerful women in the economy and Chair Powell. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> so so we, we came here today, and, and we thought we were going to be discussing this year, the recovery from a brutal two years of COVID. Mm -hmm. And instead, we've got the Russian invasion in Ukraine. We have that influencing prices and inflation. We have a dramatic shift in policy, and we have some aggressive lockdowns in China. And all of that is distorting and depressing the global economic outlook. So, so maybe, Madam MD, if you could just kick it off and set the stage for us, because you did cut your outlook for the global economy this year, and it sounds like you're going to be cutting it more. So how much of a slowdown are we facing? It is uh, quite significant. Um, last year, we were doing quite well, 6.1% growth. Uh, we were projecting slightly less, but still high uh, for this year, nearly 5%. And then we got Omicron, first revision downwards, and the war in Ukraine, second more significant revision downwards. Would there be more? It is to be seen. It depends on how long the war is going to last, how effective policymakers are going to be to deal with inflation without slowing down growth. And uh, is there something else uh, to hit us? We do live in a more shock-prone world. If anything we, we learned in these uh, two years is that we have to be more agile to build more, more resilience to these uh, shocks. And uh, one of the objectives of us meeting here in Washington is to talk with each other and identify what is the policy combination that can deal with these short-term uh, uh, challenges without jeopardizing longer-term sustainable growth. Well, we, we do have a good mix of fiscal and monetary leaders here on the panel. So, so just to follow up quickly, Madam MD, as far as the outlook and the ter deterioration, how close are we to something like a global recession? Well, we are still a very much in positive territory. Growth projection for this year, as you said, 3.6%. Let's remember that was the average growth rate between 2011 and 2019. We have a only small handful of countries that are in negative territory. Among them, Ukraine, devastated, shrinking by 40%. Russia, very significantly in fact, impacted, 11% below what we projected in uh, October. But most of the countries are growing, although uh, slowly. What is the big problem, uh, Sarah? The big problem is that the exit from the pandemic-induced crisis is now slowing down for the future. Just one number. Emerging markets and developing economies will be still 6% below their pre-pandemic trend in 2026. This is two years or more delay in their recovery. What is my biggest worry? With food prices, energy prices up, with prospects for recovery much worse, are we going to see the phenomenon from 2019, people on the street, unrest, creating more difficult environment for policymakers to do the right thing? Yeah, we're going to get into some of those risks, but I do want to hear the, the individual outlooks, especially from Europe, President Lagarde, because of its proximity to Russia and Ukraine, the spillover effects that, that you're seeing. And now there are concerns about stagflation there and the effects where it depresses economic growth and drives up prices. So how much has the outlook for Europe changed? It has changed exactly in the same direction as indicated by Kristalina. So it's been... Um, a haircut to uh, growth uh, projections, and it's been a rise in the inflation numbers. And certainly when we look at, at the risks, 
uh, they're skewed to the downside for growth, so there might be more cuts uh, uh, to come, and to the upside for inflation. That's where we are. And it's particularly saddening, not only because of the death, not because of the destruction, not because of the devastation, which in and of itself uh, is a cause for huge concern and sympathy and support for the people of Ukraine and blame for those who took the initiative of that uh, unjustifiable invasion, Russia. But it's also causing harm throughout the world, mm -hmm. predominantly in Europe for the moment. But it will, you know, there will be ripple effects going way for, you know, way beyond uh, Europe. For the moment, as you said, geography plays a role, and and Europe is literally next door. Ukraine is 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 one of us, and uh, and uh, taking taking this horrible <clears throat> hit. Uh, we are seeing refugees uh, out of Ukraine into many of our European uh, shores and countries. And, uh, and we have to, by solidarity, do everything we can to support them. Uh, that's the situation that we have at the moment in, in Europe. It is particularly saddening as well to see that the recovery that we uh, were embarking uh, on is, is being stalled to a certain degree uh, by what is happening uh, out there. What if Europe takes another step and, and does ban Russian oil, gas, and coal? What would happen to the European economy? Well, let me just first of all uh, salute uh, the sanctions that were decided uh, on a pretty uh, global basis. Sanctions against the oligarchs, sanctions against the family members and the people at the origin of this um, unjustifiable war. Um, De-swifting of about 80% of the banking sector of Ukraine, of uh, Russia, and also freeze of the assets of the uh, National Central Bank of Russia that could be identified outside of Russia and a couple of other countries. So these, this bulk of, you know, there were five uh, set of sanctions decided one after the other, has clearly had a massive impact on Russia. And, uh, and will continue to have an impact. And I think we will, the, the more it's rolled out, the more impact it will have. Obviously, the next question that everybody is agitating and, and considering is what happens with the oil on the one hand, the gas on the other hand. I think the issue of coal has been addressed by the Europeans together who've decided to ban coal. Uh, coming out of Russia. And, you know, I think it's, it's a process. And I would not exclude that there be more decisions to come uh, as, uh, as it unfolds. Chair Powell, the U.S. has been a relative bright spot in the global economy. Mm -hmm. But now policies are changing, as you know, to address inflation. And there are concerns globally about the tightening of monetary policy. <clears throat> What's the U.S. outlook? And, and how are you feeling right now about your claim that, that we're not heading toward recession. I guess I'd start by saying that, that we are unified with our allies around the world in opposition to the, in, uh, the invasion of Ukraine for no reason and the human suffering that's going on there. And while, while these economic matters are important, there are, there are very fundamental things at stake there that we, we, we want to keep in mind. Um, so in terms of the U.S. economy, we are a bit more remote from the immediate uh, infect, uh, effects of of the war uh, compared to Europe, for example. Uh, but we will be feeling them over time, and they will come in the form of upward pressure on inflation, further upward pressure, and a bit of downward pressure on, on output. But the U.S. economy is, is very strong, performing very well. By most forecasts, uh, we'll have another strong growth year this year. The labor market is extraordinarily tight, extremely tight, historically so, and to the point where uh, where uh, really there's an imbalance between, uh, between supply and demand for workers. And of course, the big, the big issue that we're very focused on is inflation and getting inflation back down to our 2% goal. But if we start to slow materially in our economy, will you stop tightening even if inflation is still above your target? Well, so um, first of all, uh, you asked about a, about a soft landing. Uh, you know, basically, that's our goal. Our goal is to is to is to get demand, use our tools to get demand and supply back in sync, so that inflation moves down and do so without a slowdown that amounts to a recession. And that's our goal, and I, I don't think you'll hear anyone at the Fed say that that's going to be straightforward or easy. It's going to be very challenging. We're going to do our very best to accomplish that, and it's it's absolutely essential to restore price stability. Without price stability, really, the economies don't work without price stability. We need that to have a strong labor market for an extended period of time. We need it for financial stability. So 
we must do that. The market has 350 basis point hikes coming at the next three meetings as of this morning. Is that reasonable? So I, I, I don't I try not to comment on specific market pricing for things, but I, I will just say this. Uh, at our last uh, meeting, and this was in the, in the, min, the minutes from the meeting, Many, many on the committee uh, thought it would be appropriate for there to be one or more 50 basis point hikes. Are you one of those people? I don't disclose my own path. I try to, I try to lead the, the committee. But uh, so I think, um, uh, I think markets are, are processing what we're saying. They're reacting appropriately generally, but I wouldn't want to bless any particular market pricing. The, the thing I want to say, though, is we really are committed to using our tools to get 2% inflation back. And I think if you look at, for example, if you look at the last tightening cycle, which was a two-year string of 25 basis point uh, hikes from 2004 to 2006, inflation was a little over 3%. Uh, so inflation is much higher now, and our policy rate is, is uh, still more accommodative than it was then. So it is appropriate, in my view, to be moving a little more quickly. And I, I, also, I also think there's something in the idea of front-end loading whatever accommodation one thinks is appropriate. So... So that does close to point, yes. that points there in the direction of, of 50 basis points being on the table. Certainly, we make these decisions at the meeting, and we'll make them meeting by meeting. But I, I would say that 50 basis points will be on the table for the May meeting. Minister Miliani, are you more worried about what Fed Chair Powell is doing, or about what we're seeing in China right now with with these aggressive lockdowns because of COVID, as it relates to your economy and, and the region and emerging markets? Well, uh, United States and China, the two biggest economy in the world. Whatever happened in these two economies definitely have a spill over to the rest of the world. First, I think what uh, Chairman Powell mentioned about the challenge to stabilize uh, the price inflation uh, down definitely will require monetary tightening. And that has been communicated. Uh, we are talking about well calibrated, well communicated, well planned. So even though we cannot afford that direction of policy at least market as well as many policy maker in the emerging country and developing country need to prepare for this eventuality. I think that's one very important thing. Uh, in Indonesia case, uh, back in taper tantrum in 2013, uh, our situation today is much, much stronger. Back then, our external balance, the balance of payment in a current account deficit. And that's why even when... Uh, Federal Reserve has not yet moved, announcing it, it's already creating a huge jittery. Today, Indonesia, again, because of the, the war, unfortunately, but then creating this high commodity price, Indonesia has quite a significant commodity which is enjoying this high price. Uh, it is not appropriate, morally wrong, if I'm saying that we are having the benefit of this situation. But uh, it's, uh, our export grew by more than 24% last year. And in this uh, first three months, it's actually growing even higher than that. So we are enjoying surplus on trade account as well as on my budget. So we are in a position of strong uh, uh, position in which then uh, this kind of situation, uh, hopefully we are going to be much less affected. Although capital outflow is happening already on a bondholder in Indonesia, and in this case, we've already reduced the exposure of the foreign ownership on uh, uh, our bonds uh, to less than 18%. This is significantly reduced than originally 40%. So it creates stability. China uh, situation with the COVID and the policy of lockdown definitely create a lot of concern regarding their uh, global uh, their growth outlook. Uh, although in this past two days we heard from Central Bank uh, Governor Yi Gang that they are going to do all necessary to make the growth at least still continue uh, strong enough at the level that uh, definitely also create a little bit uh, comfort. But uh, the implication is going to be very deep. I mean, in Indonesia, we implemented this lockdown when we have Delta variant only two weeks. And it really erased uh, the growth on the first qu quarter last year to almost to the negative territory. So I can imagine that if you prolong this kind of lockdown, 
it will definitely have a huge, especially uh, for a city as big as Shanghai in this case. So within that concern, uh, we are not comparing which one is actually having a bigger impact, but these two very important country will definitely have a huge impact for many developing and emerging countries. And this is on top of still very difficult recovery for many countries in the world from this pandemic. Although Indonesia output is already surpassing the pre-pandemic level, so we've already 106% above uh, the pre-COVID level, but Indonesia is a few cases. Many actually struggle, as uh, Kristalina mentioned, they are still under the pre-pandemic level. Do you have a sense of how much the, the China lockdowns, especially Shanghai and Shenzhen that we saw, are holding back? supply chain even more at this point? Well, that's definitely, I mean, they are among the biggest port, uh, which, uh, and for Indonesia, as, as well as in Asia, I think China demand for many commodities is very, very important. So either this is going to be disrupt the supply chains within China, that is have the repercussion for the rest of the world, or in this case have a direct impact in terms of the demand for commodity and uh, other raw material. So that is really a, a, a concern. Prime Minister Motley, have, haven't forgotten about you, definitely want to hear from you. I think you win the award for the best growth the forecast the from the IMF this year, right? 11.2% growth. Um, t tell us what, what you're experiencing. You, it, obviously, there's a big tourism boom, but you've, you've heard about all these headwinds, and I'm curious how, how you're affected by it and, and what what you're most focused on. Yeah, I think that the figures you quoted are what we are hoping for growth to next, this coming year. But like everywhere else, we are going to have to probably moderate because of the very, very uncertain challenges in the world. And of course, we're not only talking about the war in Ukraine, but we're also talking, as you just referred to, to the difficulties as a result of the lockdown in China. Um, for us, it is probably the, the inflation is more of a supply chain problem because excessive demand hasn't really come back as we would like. Um, our economy fell by about 14% in 2020, as did all other tourism and travel dependent economies in the world in the first year of the, of, of the pandemic. Um, what we are seeing is literally um, an increase in inflation. Um, by the end of last year, inflation was regrettably up to almost 6% from just over 2-3% um, before. So when that is now compounded by the war in ukraine and the supply chain problems again with the lockdown in china we expect to see continued inflationary pressures and then when you add to that the the tightening of, of monetary policy that's going to be worse for us because you have to recall that unlike other countries the only thing we could really do was literally to increase debt. We don't have the benefit of the fiscal and monetary relaxation that Europe and the UK and the US were able to do so successfully in the middle of the pandemic. We don't have those options. And that is why for us, the whole injustice of the moment probably relates to the fact that the enormous COVID debt that we've accumulated has now also to, to limit the space that we have to be able to fight inflation because in small economies such as ourselves, small open economies, as you know, um, the only way we can cushion inflation is by expanding um, our fiscal position to be able to, to, to buffer people. So these things are truly concerning to us. The issue of the debt is even more so. Mm -hmm. uh, and let us compare, as I have done for the <clears throat> last two years, the GSSI and the Common Debt Framework as against what had been done by the G7 countries. And let us also reflect on the fact that we're not going to be serious unless we bring the non-Paris Club actors to the table. The private sector has to come. And we're not going to be serious until we address the issue of the climate crisis and the funding that's necessary. Because at the same time that we're facing all of this, we have less than 12 years to adapt to our very, very, very light ability of a 1.5 degree world. But even if it doesn't get there at 1.2, as you all know, we're already seeing the devastating impacts of the storms and the hurricanes. But what most people don't know about are the droughts and the sargassum seaweed and the destruction of the coral reefs that lead to coastal erosion. So at a time when we need to have expenditure more than ever, there is, usually, there is little concessionary funding available, there's little fiscal space available, and there's an urgent need for us to seriously reform the international financial institutions if we are to be equal 
to the majority of poor people who don't live, by the way, in poor countries. 75% of the poor people of the world live in income countries mm -hmm. that are denied access to concessionary funding and that do not have the fiscal space even when they get funded and that have been compounded <clears throat> by events outside of control in the pandemic and indeed, of course, with the climate crisis. That sounds like a to-do list for the IMF. <laughs> so much so. <laughs> uh, uh, Mia, I have a piece of really good news for you. You have been championing the, the uh, allocation of concessional finance, not only on income per capita, but also on vulnerability to climate shocks. And uh, today, yep. at the uh, uh, discussions we had, the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, which will provide long-term maturity finally financing to uh, vulnerable middle countries uh, got a big boost. We signed up uh, already $40 billion for it. So one uh, instrument that, that you should ta take pride of, uh, when uh, Christine was, was the managing director of the IMF, I remember you saying to us, there has to be allocation of concessional finance linked to vulnerability, it has happened. Uh, but uh, let me take uh, two more points of, uh, of uh, uh, Mia's, Mia's list, if I, if I may. The first one is the issue of debt. Uh, in 2020, debt levels have jumped for an uh, understandable reason to put the floor under the economy. Uh, largest increase since the Second World War in one year. In 21, it was easy because uh, interest rates were low, access to financing abundant. For some, it was cheaper to pay for more debt in 21 because of this drop in, in interest rates. 22, different. In 22, we have to brace for uh, quite a number of low-income countries, some middle-income countries, to hit the wall. And uh, we have to be uh, honest, that requires upfront action by the countries themselves. Do all you can, extend maturities. If you have currency mismatches, fix it. Uh, but also for us, and the IMF has its own responsibility. We have to help countries restructure that early. And if we don't, down the road this year, we may be in a very difficult place. Uh, uh, you talked about the 50 basic uh, points. Uh, just imagine what it means for uh, emerging uh, economies if, on top of it, their currency depreciates, which is also possible, uh, and uh, capital starts seeking the comfort of coming here to the United States. Very important uh, problem. And the, and the other one I want to touch very briefly on is uh, climate change. Um, it is not going away. On the contrary, it is getting worse. For shock-prone countries, this requires for them to take measures to make their economies less vulnerable to these shocks, for the rest of the world to provide them with the support that is uh, necessary. Sri Mulyani co-chairs the uh, um, group of finance ministers that are wrestling with this uh, issue. We have to come up with practical, very effective uh, schemes uh, because if we don't, it would be for these countries, for these vulnerable countries, it would be a shock they cannot anymore sustain on their own. Wanna, since we're on the policy discussion, I do want to dive a little bit into monetary policy since we have the, the world's two leading central bankers at this table. And, and maybe I'll ask you, MD, who has a tougher job right now? This guy or uh, President Lagarde? Whoa. Uh, well, they both are fully equipped to do their jobs. And as a result, it is easy for both of them. Yeah. I think we can agree with that. Yeah. But President Lagarde, so, so clear, Europe is dealing with sky-high inflation rates as well, highest we've seen in the, in the Eurozone. Why are you not sounding as hawkish as Chair Powell when it comes to raising interest rates and tackling inflation? Well, first of all, I'm not, I'm not a hawk. 
I'm not a dove, and I'm carrying this little owl with me all the time to remind myself that everything that we eventually decide has to be a concerted, coordinated, collective decision. Um, but I think you ask a really important question, and I thank you for that, because it's often the case that commentators, uh, analysts will just put the two of us in the same bag, and I'm very proud to be associated with, with Jay Powell because <laughs> I respect him uh, greatly. But our economies are moving at a different pace. Our inflation are fed by different components. And as a result of that, our analysis of the roots and the consequences of inflation have to be different. Let me just give you um, an example, and I'll just speak for Europe, and then I'll let my, my colleague, uh, Mr. Powell, speak for his economy. Given that we have both the objective of price stability, which is the driving uh, compass um, for us, our inflation numbers are very high. You're right, you know, 7.4% in March, and we will be, you know, more than double above the target at the end of the year. But when you try to understand what comprises that very high number, you see that almost 50% of it is energy prices. So that's a supply shock that uh, we are taking. Um, if I look at my core inflation, so if you take out food, you take out energy, I'm down to 3%. It is north of my target, which is 2, but it is more manageable, if I may. Um, it's actually 2.9% because it's just been revised uh, this morning. So our inflation is fueled by a supply shock, which calls for a particular type of response, which brings together fiscal policies and monetary policy. And obviously, you know, we cannot operate at the same pace, with the same sequence, uh, using the same instrument uh, necessarily when it's that kind of inflation that we are dealing with. So it is much broader base than it was. It is much higher than uh, our target, but it is supply driven, number one, and it needs to be addressed in a sequential, flexible, gradual way, which is what we, are, uh, we have begun doing. We have started the journey back in December. We have reinforced that position in March and we will have uh, a new uh, set of fresh data in June, uh, which is when we have our next Monetary Policy Governing Council, at which point we will have to determine when we stop net asset purchases in the course of the third quarter, of course, but when in the third quarter? Is it going to be early? Is it going to be later? To be determined by the data that we receive. And that will then lead us to assess whether or not an interest hike is needed, and at, one po at what point in time uh, after the net asset purchases have concluded. So you don't have that in your mind, that you'll be raising interest rates, say, in July? I have all the steps, all the tools, and all the sequences in my mind all the time. <laughs> and what I look at all the time, too, is the various indicators that are provided by the forecasters, by market analysts, by markets, by consumers, by uh, the labor market, which informs us, because clearly the second round um, um, inflation is, is one component that for us is critically important in order to determine whether inflation expectations are well re-anchored uh, at around 2% or whether they are at risk of de-anchoring. So that's what I have on my mind all the time. But to be, moving up a to, little be bit, aren't they? to be fixated on a day, a time in the day, doesn't make any sense <coughs> to me. Because once we say that we are data dependent, for goodness sake, let's wait until we have the data and then we move on to decide. And we've agreed on a sequence. We have to follow that sequence in the journey that we have embarked upon. What about inflation in the U.S.? Some are wondering if it's peaked. Do you think so? So let me say one of the great benefits of the IMF meetings is the chance to talk and collaborate. Christine and, and me and uh, all of our colleagues talk about these things, and we find a couple of things. First is that in inflation is really a global problem. It's, it's quite everywhere, and it's high in most places. But there, there are differences. There are certainly differences. So in the United States, we have very strong growth. 
and we have higher inflation, we have higher core inflation than, than Europe does, for example. We also came into this. Europe has struggled more than we have with, with low inflation, well below target, had a much lower policy rate. So we, we have a different level of underlying inflation. So they're just differences. And, of course, we all serve domestic mandates. So in the case of the United States, um, you know, we have had an expectation that, that inflation would peak around this time and would come down over the course of the rest of the year to an extent and then come down further in 2023. These expectations have been disappointed in the past, and so now we're really in wanting to see actual progress. There's a, it may be that, that the actual peak was in March, but we don't know that, and so we're not going to count on it. And we're, we're also no longer going to count on um, help from supply side healing. We're, we're going we're gonna, to, if we get that, that'll be great, and I think that would be enormously helpful in, in having a, a, a soft landing. But, but uh, we're really going to be raising rates and getting expeditiously to levels that are more neutral and then that are actually tight, tightening policy, if that turns out to be appropriate once we get there. But isn't it going to be hard to control inflation through tightening when a lot of it is coming from the fact that Russia and Ukraine are major exporters of so many commodities that we need. We don't know how long this war is going to go on. We don't know how long China is going to be seeing these rolling shutdowns and therefore more supply crunch. How, isn't it going to be harder than normal to get a handle on inflation through your policies? Yeah, we, we can, of course can't affect supply side issues. We really can't affect much food and energy prices either in the near term. So it comes down to what we, what we can do is our tools work on demand. But we have a, we have a job to do on demand, and I, I'll, I'll go point to the labor market. There are, you know, substantially m more uh, job openings than there are people who are unemployed. And if you, if you, if you take total employed people plus job openings, that's demand for labor. If you look at the size of the labor force, there are more than 5 million more demand than there is supply. So we've got a demand-supply imbalance in the labor market and elsewhere in the economy. It's, it's clear, and that comes from a number of things, including fiscal policy, including what we did in the, in, at the height of the crisis. So there is a demand job to do, but you're right. We, we can't fix supply-side problems. Do you need the stock market to be lower to well, impact I, demand? You know, we, I, we wouldn't, I never would point to one particular price or asset or class of assets, but generally the way our policy works is we, we control one overnight rate plus the balance sheet also has some effects. But, and that affects broader financial conditions, and that includes asset prices, include credit availability, risk spreads, all, all kinds of financial conditions. Uh, and, and the financial conditions, in the end, those are what affect the real economy. So we monitor financial conditions. So there really are two steps there. And... You know, you're, it, one of the many, there, there are many different uh, uh, combinations that are possible of, of financial conditions. And we have seen some tightening from our, uh, you know, from our rate increases, and that's to be expected. So some people have this idea, President Lagarde, that, that, that you guys need to shock the markets to really to st to start to see more of an impact when it comes to putting pressure on demand and, and on inflation. Is that something you... Describe to you? I, th I think what we need to do is communicate with as much clarity as possible as to uh, what what we analyze, what we see, what timing we have in mind, and and what what journey uh, we are embarking on. And you know, for us, it's it's not so much an issue an issue of tightening when we look at the real rate. It's an issue of normalizing monetary policy, uh, and and uh, using the tools that we have. I think the added dimension that Europe has is that it's a monetary union with the complexity of a monetary union where you have 19 different uh, fiscal policies, 19 different uh, treasuries, and, and that makes my job just a little bit more complicated. <laughs> but you also have the euro, which, because you're moving at a slower pace, is weakening pretty substantially. Is, is it getting too weak and making the inflation problem worse? No, we don't target any, any particular exchange rate. Uh, we pay attention to it. It clearly has an impact on inflation. Uh, but we don't we don't target uh, any exchange rate. Minister Miliani, want to, want to move it to the the fiscal side of things. We've gotten we've, we've done monetary policy. Um, <laughs> a, as you look at the appropriate policies right now, you know it's a little tricky because normally the IMF would advocate for fiscal stimulus in a in a weakening global economy. Can't do that now when we have such a such a strong inflationary environment. So how are you thinking of the sort of policies to insulate your economy from some of these issues? Well, first, we are not starting from uh, the situation which is uh, favorable after two years of the pandemic, which is widening the deficit and debt for all countries in the world. That's one thing. Second, with the interest rate inflation and the interest rate response, 
the cost of borrowing definitely is going to be high. So if you are going to continue boosting, this is the supply demand side in this case. If you look at the recovery in Indonesia case, demand has been now growing very fast. Consumption recover with the mobility because of the pandemic under control, investment recover, export is double digit growth. So we don't have this the recovery from the demand side. If it is going to be a problem, whether this can create overheating, but our inflation is uh, now uh, around 2%. So it's much, much lower in this case. The problem on the supply side is much more complicated as uh, uh, Chairman Powell mentioned. If it is related to the energy and food, it politically, socially very sensitive. You cannot delay on that side. And that's why usually that immediately creates a fiscal pressure in the form of are you going to allow this shock coming from outside pass through directly to the people or you are going to absorb this shock through your fiscal policy by providing subsidy and then your deficit will be widened, that deficit is going to be too costly because the interest rate now is much higher. So this is really not, not a free lunch or free policy. You really have to be very careful in designing all aspects of the fiscal side. I think for, from the Minister of Fine point of view, you should not, uh, just like uh, Christine mentioned, you should not narrow your instrument. You have a lot of options. In the fiscal side, you have on revenue side, so on tax, non-tax revenue, excise. You really have to look at uh, the composition of your revenue, which one is actually strong enough to then you can collect more. And that's why in Indonesia, even during pandemic, we reformed the tax. Taxes and we passed through legislation, we harmonizing the whole legislation related to the tax, including anticipating to this global taxation agreement in which we are going to have at least a better arrangement on the taxation uh, across country. The second one, you look at the spending side, and this is exactly our spending in the past two years dominated mainly by the COVID-related spending health vaccine, uh, re, uh, treatment, therapeutic. So now when the declining rate of the uh, COVID, meaning that you have a fiscal space, you don't want to squeeze so that the economy is going to weak again. So the same space, but you free up from this health, you can use it for others. For example, infrastructure again, uh, labor intensive infrastructure so that you can create job because many of them is actually unemployed or reduce their income during the pandemic, that can be done. So expenditure side definitely have a room for that, for you to really do in a much more detailed way what that can create job better, what that can shield the shock, for example, like food security, energy security, infrastructure that can improve your productivity. So that is very important. Then you are dealing with the financing strategy. With this higher borrowing cost, you have to be very careful. So fiscal consolidation is definitely very important. In Indonesia, we are reducing our deficit from 6.1% to 4.5%. We are aiming for 4% and then below 3%. That is the fiscal discipline of the Indonesia fiscal policy in the past 20 years. So we only have three years during this pandemic to allow to have the fiscal deficit above 3%. That's signaling to the market that we are on our track credible enough so that the market is going to price our bond correctly in this case. So they are not creating excessive punishment mm. only because uh, Chairman Powell said that I'm going to do the 50 basis point how many times. That is going to be he something did? that... What did he say on well, that? No. <laughs> Prime Minister, because you're asking the question. Yeah, no, basically so. <laughs> Prime Minister Motley, you, know, you, you brought up food insecurity in your very powerful, I went back last night and watched powerful. it again, inspiring speech at the UN last fall, I believe. I, that, that was before any of this got so extreme because of yep. the war in Russia. So I'm, so I'm curious how you're thinking about it now and, and what sort of solutions we can look at. Well, the truth is that all of us have had to go into a situation where we put measures in place to boost food security, food and nutritional security. In the Caribbean community, we've set a target, which was there before all of this, of reducing imports by 25% by 2025. And we have an agricultural investment conference coming up in Guyana, which is the lead country 
on food security for us in the Caribbean community. But I, I make the point because I heard my colleague Minister just now referring to what has to be done in order to protect our people against these pressures. The reality is that with a high debt um, framework, as most of our developing countries mm -hmm. have, as small island developing states, not because of profligacy, not because of corruption, but largely because of having to take on our balance sheets the, the consequences of the actions of others, we feel that the time has now come for us to make some decisions to mm -hmm. change it. And, Kristalina, you're absolutely correct about the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, and we thank you for it. And, in fact, it's a right step in the right direction. It's the only step thus far that acknowledges vulnerability, but we need the World Bank and the development banks to go further with us. And the reality, one of the things you said to us at the beginning of the pandemic was that you needed us to keep to, to spend the money but keep the receipts. And we did, in fact, keep the receipts. So it should be easy to identify COVID-specific debt. It should even be easy to identify climate-related debt. But what we need to do, because of our highly indebted in already, is to put this on another international balance sheet. You can perhaps have a pandemic trust and you can have a climate adaptation trust. Mm. But the reality is, is that what we need is to be able to move it off of our balance sheet yeah. because if it is on our balance sheet, then it precludes us mm -hmm. from being able to achieve the SDGs, which is our normal development trajectory. And we really want you to perhaps treat it like the British war debt um, if, if it has to come on our balance sheet. Because if it's coming on our balance sheet, how do you have a situation where the British understood after World War I, they issued bonds in 1914 and 1917 as 30-year debt at 5%, consolidated them in 1932 to 3.5% with no maturity, mm -hmm. and it became perpetual debt that they paid off 100 years after the 1914 debt. Now, we have to think outside mm -hmm. of the box because it's becoming increasingly difficult even for us to shield our populations with the limited fiscal space that we have against the fact that the cost of debt is likely to increase because of, of, of the um, monetary conditions tightening and because of the fact that we just simply are not seeing the rate of economic recovery as quickly as we need to. Now, we're confident that tourism recovery usually can come back and bounce back quicker than most. But what is happening with the increased fuel costs will affect the cost of flights, will affect also how people view where they want to go. And you have to ask yourself, and, and, and Christine, you're perhaps better in a position to say this, is there still an, a strong appetite for travel in Europe, given what is happening with the war in Ukraine? Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. I, 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 I just hope that we can take the bold and brave decisions necessary, because too many people's lives are at stake, mm -hmm. and quite frankly, it cannot be a unidimensional conversation either about what is happening in Ukraine alone. We are totally sympathetic. But what's happening to the people in Tigray? What's happening to the people in Yemen? What's happening to the people elsewhere that are also on the verge of a humanitarian crisis, if not in the midst of that crisis already? There's a lot there. Any, any a few questions? I think, I, we can... I, I think Mia is totally right. And I think that we should acknowledge that all wars are horrible, our human tragedy, our causing devastation and, and economic harm. All wars. Uh, but, and this one is, is, is no different. And it is, it is self-inflicted by, by Russia in a, in a determined and totally unjustifiable way. But all wars are, are, to be, uh, are, are to be stopped. You're completely right. And consequences of war, when you look at Afghanistan, for instance, that's another place where clearly the consequences of, of wars and years of wars are, are, are hurting people and hurting women more than anything else, actually. MD, did you want to respond to on well, the debt the, question? When the IMF was created, the main objective was to help countries correct domestic policies that are undermining their opportunities to grow and create employment. Today, what Mia is saying is we live in a world in which there are exogenous shocks that are harming countries and are putting them in a position in which on their own, they simply cannot handle it. And the question in front of us is, how do we recognize that it is not bad governance, it is not bad policies, it is 
a climate shock, a pandemic, a war that is dramatically impacting a country and what is the role of international institutions to be a corrective force in that regard. During our meetings this time, this issue of what is the role of the IMF in a world of multiple shocks, some of which are because of the evil of men, some of which are because of mother nature, but they are devastating countries to a point in which they simply cannot pull themselves out. This is one issue, and Mia is right, we have to work on identifying instruments. We are looking into uh, our debt for uh, climate swaps, a possibility. We haven't advanced it enough. It is still in the universe of retail. In other words, I would do it for you, for your project. We want to move it to performance indicators and the world of wholesale. In other words, we do programs with a country like Barbados. The second issue, though, is that not all problems are exogenous. We still have plenty of problems that come because of poor judgment, bad governance, corruption. Uh, when Christine was uh, the managing director here in 2018, early 2019, in these good days that we almost forgot existed, she would say, when the sun is shining, fix, fix the roof. The roof. Mm -hmm. What we are now discovering is that many countries did not fix the roof when the sun is shining. Now it is pouring. Well, maybe now we get to fixing the roof. I would strongly argue that there are many countries where structural reforms, reforms related to transparency, improvements in governance, can significantly improve image attractiveness for private investments and performance. Indonesia has done systematic reforms that took Indonesia now to be in the small universe of countries, emerging market countries, that have caught up with their pre-pandemic level. And I think for, for us, we should not shy away from the issue of good policies mean better lives of people. You mentioned the role of the IMF. You know, th there is this bigger question right now about the role of globalization in general and, and the onshoring of manufacturing and supply chain. And it started with COVID or maybe even before that and really got exacerbated by this war in Ukraine. And obviously, Chair Powell, there are going to be ramifications of this for growth and for inflation if we are, in fact, in a world where globalization is going in reverse or even dying. What do you think? Well, that is, that is certainly a possible outcome here. I think you've seen um, questions about globalization, and this this uh, series of events around Ukraine certainly has the, the possibility of leading to a more fragmented political situation and economic situation. Mm -hmm. uh, you saw Secretary Yellen's speech this week about uh, about looking to, uh, I think she called it, friendshoring. So I think there's a lot of thinking going on like that. You know, the, the globalization that we had uh, had benefits to it and it had cost cost in, involved in it, um, and you know these are really questions more for elected governments, I would say, than they are for the for a central bank. But there there would certainly be, be a different world. It might be a, a world of perhaps higher inflation, perhaps lower productivity, but more resilient, more robust supply chains. If we were to have, uh, I mean, the supply chains that we had were were very efficient, but quite fragile. It turned out, so. Uh, and, and I think it's it's not clear that we're that we're seeing a reversal of, of globalization. It, it is clear, I think, that it's certainly slowed down, and it may go into reverse. I don't know. Is, is that? I mean, clearly, Europe's thinking about it in terms of security and things like energy and, and dependence on, on that sort of thing. Do you think we're we're going in reverse? No, I think we are going to revisit uh, the terms of trade and who we are trading with and on what principles we are determined to continue trading. And, uh, and reorganizing supply chains. And, you know, for once, I'm quite happy to actually um, plead for the case of Europe because there's, there's always Europe bashing now and again. <laughs> um, and I think that the, the work that we had to do over the last uh, 70 years 
and the adjustment that we had to make moving from a small group of six to now 27 countries, which are all members of this you know, single market where goods, capital and people move freely, has been a laboratory of um, a different kind of trade. And it is not easy, let's face it. There are countries sometimes that are drifting, that would like to operate slightly differently. But where the governance, the rule of law, the principles by which we abide when we join the club, keep us together and keep up on, 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 on track with those key principles that we respect. So it is a bit of a laboratory, and I would hope that as we, as we re-examine and revisit globalization, which has provided a lot of good in and of itself, mm -hmm. we can use that experience to see how we can enforce, how we can govern, how we can make sure that everybody is included, uh, that you know, we don't leave some by the side of the road, but we try to be together and make sure that it is inclusive. I know it's something you're thinking about a lot, I mean, yes, maybe it's a course. taboo topic to talk about in an IMF <laughs> World Bank meeting, but, but this idea of the fragmentation, of what's happening geopolitically and the alliances that are forming and how that's going to drive the underlying free movement of trade and people and capital. The, we are living in a, in a multipolar world, and that has already led to some frictions and uh, some shifts in uh, trading part, uh, partners. But... I am in the both of those who say we are so integrated and if you make a list of the problems that no one country can resolve on its own, it's a very long list, we have to find ways to work together. So what is the question? Are we going to evolve in blocks that are closed and function independently from each other or we would have some preferences, trading, preferred trading partners, but we will have highways and bridges that allow us to still solve big problems, come on the same page. What was so interesting today in our discussions was how strong the voice of we have to work together was in the room. And it was especially emerging markets and developing economies that said, hey, we have achieved so much because of this integrated global economy. It is irresponsible to make the world poorer. And actually, Sri Mulyani spoke so well that it is the quality of our world, not just the quality of our economies mm -hmm. that is uh, at stake, but it is more difficult and it makes my job even more important in finding place for all of us uh, to agree. You probably have heard the story of communiques not materializing, didn't materialize for us at the uh, uh, IMFC, but, but if everybody agreed on the substance of the policy conclusions and recommendations, everybody, everybody. And then we had one member that said, well, but you're saying something else there that I don't agree with. Mm -hmm. It is very, very early in my view to go and buy a coffin for globalization. Not that yet. <laughs> that, that, that's quite a statement. Minister Miliani, curious about your take and whether you find yourself in, the, in sort of an awkward position because of the close trade ties with China and proximity there, and then obviously the relationship with the U.S. and also as the chair of G20 mm -hmm. and the developing nations there, how, how you sort of weave all of this together. Well, um, all emerging country, developing country, or from developing country to become emerging country, they usually can achieve those level of progress because they, are, they were open, mm. they are also integrated with the global economy. Yeah. So when Christine was uh, in the IMF, uh, I think telling about uh, the globalization has reduced a lot of poverty and that's why what we are aiming or the focus for many countries is how you are going to prepare the foundation of your economy, whether this is on a policy level, institutional level, 
as well as the practice of the business that need to be competitive so that you are going to be able to have this efficiency, productivity, and then improvement on the uh, livelihood of the people. Now it's changed. The language is no longer about efficiency, but all on security, talking about uh, reliability. So even I think we just heard from uh, Chairman Powell that if that is uh, at the cost of efficiency, be it maybe. Now, that's really maybe creating a huge impact for many developing country, emerging country, who they, in this case, enjoying this improvement as well as the progress in their economy and prosperity through globalization, through trade and investment. And this is no longer become the instrument. Now for Indonesia, because we are big enough country, the biggest in the ASEAN economy, and of course in terms of the trade partner, investment partner, United States, European, Japan, and China, they are all the biggest partner for Indonesia, of course. Within the ASEAN, we have, for example, with Singapore. So the choices is there. And we enjoy this because we know that the world following and uh, implementing the global rule, even though it's not perfect. If you talk about WTO, there is here and there. But we know that there is a rule as a baseline in which we will play based on that. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what holding all of us the, the world together. Yeah. Now, if a country can violate international rule, or in this case that uh, we no longer trust this rule can secure or providing safety and security and certainty, then the world is actually resetting. It's totally different. Mm -hmm. And this is his historical in a way. Because the world enjoying huge progress in terms of prosperity. If you look at the declining of the poverty rate, improvement in the human capital index, infrastructure development, they are all because we rely on this goodwill, trust, and building this rule for all country in which then we can rely. I'm not saying it was proper. It is not. No, it is not. It is yes. always like. Yep. But it serves well, or at least it serves all the member country in this world to actually rely on this kind of mechanism. Now, I think it's shaky. And that is exactly maybe what is the highest risk for any country to design their own policy. What does it mean for Indonesia? Should we like self-sufficient in this case? For Indonesia, it could be because we are big. We have a lot of land. We have fertile land. So we do have like the food security, energy security, we have coal, we have oil, we have gas. But not all countries have this kind of luxury like us. And so should we not care about others? That is not uh, really, I think, uh, the, the right, uh, morally not right, as well as uh, from the interests of the global economy, it is not also right. We're, we're really, we're tight on time. We have one minute left, but I do want to hear really quickly from everyone, including you, Prime Minister Motley. It, it, I sometimes get the best answers as a journalist when I ask people what I'm not, what we're not paying attention to, what the media or the world is not focused on. So I'll ask you just very quickly, either an upside risk or a downside risk as it relates to the global economy, what we're not paying close enough attention to and, we sh and what, what you would flag. And Prime Minister Motley, put you on the spot and, and go to you first. I'm saying that there's an absence of global coordinated political leadership. The G20 is not representative enough, and we don't have the political will. The problem is not with the people who you have in the studio for the most part. It's not the heads of the institutions. It's the absence of countries to act in a coordinated way that will relieve the pressure. We saw it in the pandemic. We're seeing it with, the, with too many other issues, and hopefully we can get um, the sense of urgency of the moment impressed on all of us globally such that we can avert the worst. Mm. Minister Mulyani, what about you? Well, I think as a, uh, holding this presidency of G20, what is remarkable, remarkable uh, given this tension, all country that we consulted, because G20 is based on the consensus, all country that we consulted, they believe and they also want that the cooperation and collaboration and coordination, what uh, Prime Minister Maya mentioned, is actually the one that they want this to be preserved, regardless differences. Mm 
So amazingly, what we are thinking is supposed to be safe and preserved in what the reality that we are now facing is actually quite a big gap. So our responsibility holding this presidency is try to continue making, making this goodwill of collaboration and cooperation. Try to save a piece of the world most important asset that is coordination and collaboration. Will Putin be at G20 in Bali this year? Well, we invited because uh, inviting the head of state cannot be like, oh, tomorrow we are going to have a G20 and then they just send. We invited like uh, back then and it's already now all the country in the G20 received the invitation. In terms of the arrangement of the meeting itself, just like what we have yesterday, it was not easy, but at the end they are all in the same room. Uh, but if uh, you don't agree and you want to express this politically, like Christine, he walked out. So that's that's another expression of the polity. But it doesn't prevent us to talk about the substance, which is important, not only serving the G20, but also for the rest of the world. So it should be manageable and doable. Mm. Chair Powell, what are we not paying enough attention to? So I'll, I'll tell you what I'm thinking about, which is, you know, we had this economy that was, you know, very low inflation, uh, very low unemployment in everywhere in the world uh, before the pandemic. Then the pandemic comes in and really knocks everything sideways. Mm -hmm. Then we have this remarkable, particularly in the United States, response, uh, incredibly fast recovery, faster than anyone hoped. Uh, and then we have inflation. And so that's a lot right there. And then we have a war. And now we're realizing that COVID is still really with us. So what, what I'm thinking about is a couple of things. One is, how is this, are we going back? Probably not to the old economy. What's the new one going to look like? The other thing maybe more pertinent to your question is, in the middle of this is a labor market in the United States where people can get paid well. It's, it's, it's too hot. You know, it's, not, it's unsustainably hot, but not, notwithstanding it, it's a very, very good labor market for workers. And it's our job to, to get it into a, to a better place where supply and demand are closer together. But I'd say that's, uh, that's how I'd respond. In the upside category, risk, you're saying wages are good, people can get jobs. I think there's a lot to something. like about yeah. the U.S. labor market, but I, I'd be the first to say, though, that it's, it's not sustainably uh, hot. But I do think with our tools, we can get supply and demand uh, better aligned. President Lagarde, what about you? What should we be paying more attention to? I think of two things. One is what I would call the green swan. Uh, we talk about black swans, and, and I agree with, with Jay that we've, we've had one thing after the other hitting us, and in the main, we've tried to respond as, as, as well as we could, and often in a very coordinated fashion, thanks to international institutions like the IMF. But the green swan is something that, that terrifies me. You know, when I think of what's happening in South Africa at the moment, the hundreds of people that are dying uh, because of... Uh, of flood and and you know what's going to come next could it be mother nature that we are hurting so much that it retaliates against mm. us so that that's one thing that is that is often on my mind i think the next one is the madness of man mm. more than women actually <laughs> always <laughs> yeah. madam md um, i i think we are not paying sufficient attention to the law of unintended consequences we take decisions with an objective in mind and rarely think through what may happen that is not our objective. Uh, and then uh, we wrestle uh, with, the, with the impact of it. Um, take uh, any, any, any decision that is a massive decision, like uh, the decision that we need to spend to support the economy. And at that time, we did recognize that may lead to too much money in circulation, too few goods, but didn't really quite think through the consequence in a way that mm. upfront would have informed better uh, what, what we do. And I subscribe entirely what, to what uh, uh, Christine said about uh, climate shocks. We are already out of time. And the uh, fact that whenever something hits us, we forget about this other crisis is inc incredibly troubling. The fact that we are, I'm sorry I'm going on here, but I'll finish in a second. <laughs> we act sometimes like eight years old playing soccer. 
here is the ball, we are all at the ball, and we don't cover the rest of the field. Our ability to deal with more than one crisis at one time is very, very limited. And we have to zero in on the really big things that would determine the future and keep our attention uh, on them. Um, when the um, war started, my daughter calls me a week later and says, Mom, what happened with the pandemic? It disappeared from media. We didn't pay any attention. It is still with us. So we have unintended consequences of actions and we have insufficient attention to cover the whole field. Well, we've covered a lot today. Uh, in this discussion. So thank you all so much for your time and your candor and taking my questions. And thanks to everybody who tuned in as well. Have a great afternoon. Thanks for being with us.